The F-111 fighter jet was once the most advanced aircraft in the world. It was fast, it was stealthy, and it was deadly. One fatal flaw threatened to destroy it, but this is how the aircraft overcame this challenge to become one of the most iconic aircraft of its time. It all began in July 1958, when U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower asked the Pakistani Prime Minister Feroz Khan Noon if the U.S. could set up a secret spy facility in Pakistan. The plan involved using a high-flying U-2 spy plane from Pakistan to keep an eye on the Soviet Union. The chosen location, Badabur near Peshawar, was ideal for monitoring Soviet activities in Central Asia, including missile tests and key infrastructure. President Eisenhower, concerned about the risk of American pilots being shot down over the Soviet Union, decided to have British pilots from the Royal Air Force take on the missions instead. This arrangement allowed the U.S. to gather intelligence without the direct involvement of American pilots, reducing the risk of sparking conflict during the Cold War. After the success of the initial British missions, pressure to assess Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles accurately led Eisenhower to approve two more missions before a crucial summit. On April 9, 1960, a U-2C spy plane piloted by Bob Erickson, part of the Special CIA Unit 1010, flew over top-secret Soviet military sites, including the Semipalatinsk test site and the Baikonur Cosmodrome, gathering crucial intelligence. Flying over 250 kilometers beyond the Soviet border, it skillfully evaded MiG-19 and Su-9 interception attempts. The stakes were high, the tension palpable, but the U-2 successfully exited Soviet airspace and touched down at an Iranian airstrip in Zahidan. The triumph of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency in this audacious intelligence operation was undeniable. Emotions ran high as plans unfolded for the next U-2 spy plane flight from Peshawar Airport, scheduled for late April. Little did they know, the following events would plunge them into a web of uncertainty. Fast forward to April 28, 1960, at Incirlik Air Base in Turkey, where a U.S. Lockheed U-2C, under the command of pilot Glenn Dunaway, prepared for the crucial journey. Fuel had been transported to Peshawar, and a C-130 carried the ground crew, mission pilot Francis Powers, and backup pilot Bob Erickson. The stage was set for a mission destined to make history. As the crew at Badabur received news of a one-day delay, tensions mounted. With a twist of fate, Bob Erickson flew back to Incirlik, and John Shin ferried another U-2C to Peshawar. A roller coaster of events followed, with weather disruptions and subsequent delays adding an air of unpredictability. Finally, on May 1st, just 15 days before a crucial East-West Summit conference in Paris, Captain Powers took flight with Article 360, embarking on Operation Grand Slam. His mission was clear, to capture vital photographs of Soviet ICBM sites at Baikonur and Plesetsk, among other strategic targets. The Soviet Air Defense Forces, anticipating the U-2's intrusion, went on high alert across Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Siberia, and beyond. But a question arose, would they be able to intercept the elusive U-2 soaring at extreme altitudes? As powers navigated the skies, Soviet attempts to intercept him proved futile. The U-2's altitude outpaced the reach of SAM sites, and even one site failed to engage due to an off-duty status. Unfortunately, near Kosolino Ural region, the U-2 met its match. A missile fired by Mikhail Vonorov brought it crashing down. Powers, facing imminent capture, bailed out, but the tension continued. His struggle with an oxygen hose added an unexpected twist as he parachuted onto Soviet soil, thinking of what more fate had in store for him. Captured by Soviet forces, Powers carried a modified silver dollar concealing a lethal shellfish-derived saxitoxin-tipped needle, but he did not attempt to use it on himself. It's hard to know what went through his mind at that moment, but he may have realized that it was better to face the consequences of his actions than to take his own life. Power's capture and imprisonment set off a chain of events that would have far-reaching consequences for both the United States and the Soviet Union. The downing of Power's U-2 was a shock to the United States government, as it demonstrated the Soviets' advanced missile technology. Not only did the incident damage U.S.-Soviet relations, it showed that the United States plan to use high-altitude bombers in a potential conflict with the Soviet Union would not be possible. 
The Soviet Union had developed a surface-to-air missile that could reach aircraft flying above 60,000 feet, 18,000 meters. This was a huge blow to the United States military strategy and forced the U.S. Air Force to rethink its plans. The Strategic Air Command had to initiate a shift toward low-level penetration to minimize radar detection distances. Surface-to-air missiles SAMs, struggled against low-flying aircraft, while interceptor planes faced diminished speed advantages at lower altitudes. Meanwhile, the Tactical Air Command of the United States Air Force was deeply engrossed in the roles of fighter bombers and deep strike interdiction. The Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, designed for swift nuclear weapon delivery but requiring extensive runways, prompted exploration into more adaptable wing configurations. A NASA report in 1958 proposed a simpler method for implementing variable geometry wings, one that used pivot points farther from the aircraft's centerline. This new design made swing wings much more practical. After seeing the potential benefits of this new technology, leaders in the U.S. Air Force encouraged its development and use. But did this help? This development paved the way for a remarkable moment in June 1960, when the USAF issued Specification SOR-183. This directive sought a long-range interdiction strike aircraft capable of penetrating Soviet air defenses at ultra-low altitudes and high speeds. The aircraft needed to cover at least 800 miles at low-level flight, with 400 miles exceeding Mach 1.2. What added to the intrigue was the requirement for short takeoff and landing STOL, capabilities, enabling operations from short, unprepared airstrips, each no longer than 3,000 feet, Notably, an internal payload of 1,000 pounds was mandated for the primary mission, with nod to versatility through a variant suitable for aerial reconnaissance flights. This ambitious specification spurred curiosity about the technological leaps required to fulfill such multifaceted demands, leaving open questions about the cutting-edge developments that would unfold. Meanwhile, in a parallel pursuit, the United States Navy was on a quest for a long-range, high-endurance interceptor aircraft to shield carrier battle groups against Soviet threats. The challenge lay in countering long-range anti-ship missiles from Soviet jet bombers and submarines. Seeking a formidable fleet air defense fighter, the Navy embarked on the Douglas F-6D Missileer project in the late 1950s. Armed with the capability to carry six long-range missiles and loiter for five hours, the missileer, however, faced a defensive vulnerability after missile deployment, leading to its formal cancellation in 1961. The Navy's endeavors also saw the exploration of variable geometry wings with the XF-10F Jaguar in the early 1950s, albeit abandoned at that time. NASA's simplification of this technology, coupled with the increasing weight of aircraft, prompted a resurgence of interest by 1960. The allure of variable geometry wings lay in their promise of high speeds, enhanced maneuverability with heavier payloads, extended range, and the ability to operate from shorter takeoff and landing distances. By the early 1960s, advances in aircraft design had led to heavier planes that required more efficient wing designs. Variable geometry wings, which could change their shape during flight, offered the advantages of high speeds and maneuverability while carrying heavier payloads, as well as improved takeoff and landing performance. These new designs promised to open up new possibilities for military and civilian aviation. As the United States Air Force and Navy found themselves in pursuit of a cutting-edge aircraft, with each one of them with their suggestions, the appointment of Robert McNamara as the Secretary of Defense in January 1961 took place. Both military branches envisioned aircraft capable of carrying heavy armament and fuel loads, boasting high supersonic speeds, twin engines, and accommodating two seats, possibly with variable geometry wings. Instead of choosing one of the existing proposals, McNamara challenged the services to work together to develop a single aircraft that could meet the needs of both the Air Force and the Navy. McNamara's decision to pursue a common design was a bold one. It meant that rather than developing two separate aircraft, one for the Air Force and one for the Navy, they would develop a single aircraft that would meet the needs of both services. This approach promised to save money and resources, but it also carried some risks. 
But would this common design be able to meet the unique requirements of each service? Despite initial resistance from the USAF and Navy to maintain separate programs, McNamara pushed forward with the Tactical Fighter Experimental Project in June 1961. It was a decision met with disconcertment from military officials who perceived it as a compromise driven by financial considerations, as aviation author Peter E. Davis noted. The USAF and the Navy agreed on some features of the TFX project, such as a swing-wing design, two seats, and twin engines, but they had different ideas about what the plane should be able to do. The differences between the two services' requirements led to tension and delays in the project. The USAF leaned towards a tandem seat configuration for a low-level penetration ground attack, while the Navy sought a shorter, high-altitude interceptor with side-by-side -side seating for shared radar display. The USAF aimed for 7.33G with Mach 2.5 speed at altitude, while the Navy opted for 6G with Mach 2 speed at altitude and high subsonic speed at low level. McNamara, relying heavily on the USAF's requirements, established a basic set of TFX requirements on September 1, 1961. This directive led to a request for proposals in October 1961 eliciting responses from industry giants such as Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, McDonnell, North American, and Republic. Despite initial shortcomings in all proposals, Boeing and General Dynamics were chosen to refine their designs. Boeing's proposal emerged as the frontrunner in January 1962, with minor concerns about the engine and the need for adjustments to features like crew escape systems and missile storage. By April 1962, both companies submitted updated proposals, with Boeing gaining favor among USAF reviewers. However, the Navy found both submissions unsuitable for its specific operations. This divergence led to two subsequent rounds of updates, ultimately resulting in Boeing's selection by the board. Yet, as the TFX project advanced, uncertainties lingered, leaving the path ahead intriguingly uncertain for the ambitious venture. In 1962, the stage was once again set for a special moment. McNamara, the discerning decision-maker, found himself facing the crossroads of proposals. General Dynamics emerged as the chosen one, thanks to the allure of greater commonality between the USAF and Navy versions. The Boeing alternative lagged, sharing less than half of the major structural components. On the decisive 21st of December 1962, Inc. met paper as General Dynamics enthusiastically signed the TFX contract, marking the official commencement of a groundbreaking venture. However, as the ink dried, a congressional investigation loomed, probing the intricacies of the procurement process. Surprisingly, the inquiry failed to alter the predetermined destiny of the selected proposal. Fast forward to the 1st of May 1964, a contract was signed for the F-111 program. This contract included the necessary testing, equipment, training, and the production of the first 23 F-111s. The contract was a fixed-price incentive fee contract, meaning that the company was given a set amount of money for the project, with the potential for more money if the project was successful. The contract had a maximum cost of $529 million, and it had specific requirements for correcting any problems found during testing and use of the F-111. But behind the scenes, another design unfolded, led by the visionary Robert H. Widmer. Recognizing their limitations in carrier-based fighters, General Dynamics sought a dynamic partnership with Grumman in November 1963. This union extended beyond assembly and testing, with Grumman taking charge of crafting the aft fuselage and landing gear of the F-111A. The challenge at hand was nothing short of audacious, Ambitious range, weapons load, and weight requirements compelled the incorporation of novel features like variable geometry wings and afterburning turbofan engines. As destiny would have it, they did not know that these very features would become both the architects and saboteurs of the F-111's destiny. Amidst this struggle of engineering marvels and unforeseen challenges, the F-111A and F-111B shared a common lineage. The structural components of Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P-1 turbofan engines were the glue holding them together. The Navy required that the F-111B have side-by-side -side seating for the crew, as well as an escape capsule to keep them safe. 
The F-111B had a shorter nose and longer wingtips than the other F-111s to make it easier to fit on aircraft carriers. These design changes also made the F-111B easier to use on existing carrier elevators. The F-111B was different from the other F-111s in several ways. It was equipped with a special radar system called the ANAWG-9, which could guide the F-111B's AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. The other F-111s had different radar systems, like the ANAPQ-113, which helped them attack ground targets. They also had an ANAPQ-110 radar system that allowed them to fly close to the ground. In the vibrant September of 1963, Anticipation filled the air as the F-111A mock-up underwent a meticulous inspection. Fast forward to the crisp October day in 1964, the eagerly awaited test F-111A rolled out of General Dynamics Plant 4 in Fort Worth, Texas. The F-111A was powered by powerful turbofan engines, and it had ejector seats that could be used in an emergency. The escape capsule was still being developed, so the ejector seats were the only way for the crew to get out of the plane. On December 21, 1964, the F-111A made its first flight from Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. The flight lasted only 22 minutes because there was a minor problem with the flaps on the plane. Even though the flight was shortened by this issue, the flight was still considered a success. This allowed the next stage of testing to begin. As the sun set in 1964, the F-111A embarked on its journey of refinement. The early flights showcasing supersonic prowess revealed the aircraft's favorably simplistic maintenance needs and an array of promising qualities. However, 1965 brought about a series of changes driven by a sharp escalation in unit costs, skyrocketing from $4.5 million to $6 million. There were many reasons for the F-111's sudden rise in funding. One reason was a directive from military leadership, which told General Dynamics to improve the plane's technology. Another reason was that the company was allowed to develop new versions of the F-111. One version was a strategic bomber, and the other was an aerial reconnaissance plane. However, the reconnaissance version was eventually canceled. Despite these setbacks, the F-111 program was allowed to go forward but the number of planes allowed to be built was much lower than originally planned. As the tides of change continued, April gave way to May in 1967, ushering in a new era with the multi-year FPIP contract. This replaced the traditional procurement process and expanded the fleet to a total of 493 F-111s. Among them were 23 F-111Bs for the US Navy, 24 F-111Cs for the Royal Australian Air Force, and 50 F-111Ks for the Royal Air Force. With so many countries interested in the F-111, it was clear that the future of the program was promising. There were many possibilities, both explored and unexplored, that could change the direction of the program. Yet amid the soaring ambitions, the early flights of the F-111 were not without turbulence. Compressor surges and stalls cast shadows across specific flight regimes, prompting rigorous studies by NASA, the USAF, and General Dynamics. The unusual spike-shaped variable intake, chosen for performance reasons, underwent a redesign. Between 1965 and 1966, the change unfolded with the introduction of the Triple Plow 1 and Triple Plow 2 designs. In February 1965, the F-111A achieved a commendable speed of Mach 1.3, showcasing resilience with an interim intake design. At the same time, in the skies of progress, the F-111B soared on its maiden flight on the 18th of May 1965, equipped with ejector seats as its initial safety measure. But as sweet as this progress seemed and the calendar turned, Cracks in the F-111's wing attach points surfaced during ground fatigue testing in 1968. The worrying echo of a fatal incident during the subsequent year sent shockwaves through the world. The day was December 22, 1969, a date etched in history when the tragedy struck during the operational testing of rockets on the Nellis Ranges. F-111A 67-0049 under the command of the 428th TFS on the 474th TFW met its catastrophic fate. Amidst a rocket delivery recovery, a grim turn of events unfolded as a wing of the F-111A abruptly detached in flight, 
plunging the aircraft into a rapid and uncontrollable descent. The seasoned crew, consisting of Major Thomas Mack and Major James Anthony, faced the harrowing situation. Despite their extensive experience, their attempts at an out-of-module limits ejection from the spiraling aircraft proved unsuccessful. Tragically, both Major Mack and Major Anthony lost their lives in the course of duty. The aftermath of this incident went beyond the immediate loss. The F-111A involved already featured a modified carry-through box, yet the crash prompted a sweeping response. The grounding of all F-111s ensued for an extended period, as the United States Air Force imposed restrictions subjecting the entire fleet to thorough inspections and testing. Ultimately, the investigation revealed the root cause of the crash, a cracked wing box. This critical flaw became a focal point in the ongoing maintenance and safety protocols for the F-111 fleet, shaping future measures to prevent such catastrophic events. This involved a significant redesign of the attachment structure accompanied by rigorous testing to ensure both the adequacy of the new design and the quality of worksmanship. Finally, on July 31, 1970, the grounding order was lifted, marking a crucial turning point. Keep in mind that the F-111A, initially subjected to Category 1 flight testing since 1964, soldiered on until March 31, 1972. Simultaneously, Category 2 tests commenced in January 1966, while Category 3 testing faced repeated delays before being ultimately scrapped due to its perceived lack of necessity. Meanwhile, the F-111B faced cancellation by the Navy in 1968, grappling with the weight and performance concerns alongside revised tactical requirements. Australia, undeterred, pursued its variant, the F-111C. The subsequent evolution witnessed the birth of improved models for the USAF, namely the F-111E, F-111D, and F-111F, catering to diverse strategic needs. The FB-111A, a strategic bomber, and the EF-111 electronic warfare versions further expanded the F-111 family. Ultimately, production culminated in 1976, concluding with a total of 563 aircraft. The redesigned F-111 emerged as an all-weather attack aircraft, boasting the capability for low-level penetration of enemy defenses to deliver precision ordnance. Its innovative features included variable geometry wings, an internal weapons bay, and a side-by-side -side seating cockpit with an escape crew capsule. The wing's sweep would dynamically vary from 16 to 72.5 degrees, incorporating leading-edge slats and double-slotted flaps. The airframe comprised aluminum alloys, steel, titanium, and other materials strategically applied. The fuselage adopted a semi-monocue structure with reinforced panels and honeycomb elements for skin, while the horizontal stabilizer functioned as an all-moving stabilizer. The F-111's landing gear utilized a distinctive three-point arrangement, featuring a two-wheel nose gear and two single-wheel main landing gear units. Notably, the landing gear door for the main gear served the dual purpose of being a speed brake during flight. Most variants were equipped with a terrain-following radar system intricately linked to the autopilot. Powering the F-111 were two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 afterburning turbofan engines. Collectively, the variable geometry wings, escape capsule, terrain-following radar, and afterburning turbofans represented groundbreaking technologies for production aircraft. The aircraft's versatility and weaponry became subjects of keen interest and innovation. The F-111, equipped with an internal weapons bay designed to carry an array of armaments, boasted capabilities that ranged from conventional bombs to nuclear weaponry. The bay could accommodate two 750-pound M-117 conventional bombs, a nuclear bomb, or practice bombs, showcasing the aircraft's adaptability. The F-111B variant intended for the U.S. Navy had a unique purpose, being equipped to carry two AIM-54 Phoenix long-range air-to-air missiles in its bay. Intriguingly, the 20mm M61 cannon, although having a sizable ammunition tank, was rarely fitted on F-111s, adding an element of mystery to its arsenal. Evolutionary steps were taken with the F-111C and F-111F, featuring the AN-AVQ-26 PAVE-TAC targeting system that could be rotated within the weapons bay. This sophisticated system, equipped with a forward-looking infrared sensor, optical camera, and laser rangefinder designator, empowered the F-111 to designate and engage targets with laser-guided precision. 
Meanwhile, Australian RF-111Cs carried a diverse array of sensors and cameras for aerial reconnaissance, showing the adaptability of the F-111 in various roles. The FB-111 brought nuclear capabilities to the forefront, capable of carrying two AGM-69 SRAM air-to-surface nuclear missiles. General Dynamics experimented with alternative configurations, including a trapeze arrangement for AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, adding a layer of intrigue to the aircraft's potential. While the early F-111 models could guide AIM-7 Sparrow medium-range air-to-air missiles, this feature was never realized. The underwing pylons, a key feature of each wing, added another layer of flexibility. While the inner two pylons rotated to align with the fuselage, the outer two remained fixed, each boasting a capacity of 5,000 pounds. These pylons could accommodate various bombs and missiles, showcasing the F-111's adaptability to different mission requirements. Auxiliary fuel drop tanks with a substantial 600 US gallons capacity each could also be fitted for extended range. The design intricacies of the F-111's fuselage posed challenges for external weapon carriage, leading to innovative solutions. Two stations were designated for electronic countermeasures pods and or data link pods, one on the weapons bay and the other on the rear fuselage between the engines. Tactical F-111s were equipped with shoulder rails on the inner pylons for AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, enhancing self-defense capabilities. In the Australian context, F-111Cs were configured for maritime operations, capable of launching the Harpoon anti-ship missile and the Popeye standoff missile. The FB-111As, on the other hand, often utilize their wing pylons for fuel tanks or strategic nuclear gravity bombs, with the capacity to carry up to four AGM-69 SRAM nuclear missiles. The years that followed after the refinement of the F-111 were truly mind-blowing. The F-111 swooped back into Southeast Asia at Takli Air Base, Thailand in September 1972. Engaging in the final Operation Linebacker, these F-111As from Nellis AFB became the aerial maestros of Operation Linebacker 2 against North Vietnam, earning the ominous title Whispering Death. But wait, how did they manage 154 low-level missions with such precision? The crews had a mantra, speed is life, one pass, haul ass, and the unspoken rule, more than one pass in a target area and you die. The F-111's secret weapon? Terrain Following Radar, deemed the best in the fighter world by pilot Richard Crandall. Flying at a jaw-dropping 200 feet above ground at 480 knots, these jets were the rebels of the sky, operating where others dared not. One F-111 outgunned four F-4 Phantom IIs. Now that's a performance upgrade worth noting. Fast forward to the Gulf War in 1991, where the F-111s, the unsung heroes of Operation Desert Storm, not only boasted a 3.2 to 1 success ratio in strike missions, but also dropped a staggering 80% of the war's laser-guided bombs. Tank plinking, they called it. Destroying over 1,500 Iraqi tanks and armored vehicles, the F-111s became legends in the anti-armor realm. Oh, and did you hear about the unexpected plot twist on February 14, 1986? Two FB-111s embarked on a cross-country mission from Pease Air Force Base to Tinker Air Force Base, not for war, but to transport a heart for transplant. Touching down at Bradley International Airport, these warbirds showcase their versatility beyond the battlefield. This post-crash exploration of the F-111's capabilities unveils a captivating narrative of technological ingenuity and strategic versatility, showcasing how this aircraft transcended its initial setback to become a symbol of innovation in military aviation. Now let me ask you, do you think the risks and challenges of technological innovation are worth it? Do you think the rewards of pushing the boundaries of what's possible are enough to justify the risks? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more fascinating stories from the world of aviation.